Hello. Hi. How are you? Hi, Serena. Come up. Sorry, I'm sharing the link and. and Hello. Uh, hey, how are you today? Hey, Kirk. I'm early today. <laughs> yep. Hey, Victoria, how are you? Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Glad to be here. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. I didn't even know there was such a thing as, I mean, you sort of know these people that can just not get much sleep and have energy, but I didn't know it was a thing. Who eats meat these days? Sorry? It's a very recent paper, so don't, don't think bad of you because you didn't know it's a very recent paper. So. But doesn't it seem like there should be genetic linkage to sleep, sort of sleep characteristics? Because I, I've just never been a really strong morning person, no matter how happy. I mean, I wake up happy there. I want to go and do things early in the morning, but it's always somewhat painful for me. And and, you know, I'm sure everybody knows so many people who just get up early really easily and naturally. And so I've always believed there must be a genetic linkage to them. Yeah, to sleep characteristics. Yeah, I agree. I've gone through phases where sometimes I'm a morning person and other times not. It's really kind of strange. I wish. Huh. I've never been a morning for me. It's very painful, very <laughs> painful, <laughs> and I have to because the kids' school you start so early. It's horrible. Yeah, and I don't think it it reflects any lack of industriousness or any. Oh, I I think it's it's just the way it is. Welcome, Frank. Hi. Uh, I missed the uh, meeting yesterday. And uh, when I click on Zoom, uh, the welcome, uh, waiting room is waiting for me. <laughs> Probably the meeting has end. I was late. Yeah. We were having, yes. Go ahead, sister. Oh, no, I was just going to say we transferred from uh, Zoom to Clubhouse eventually. So, yeah, that happened. <laughs> oh, hello, Dr. Fool. How are you? Hi, Dr. Fool. How are you? Thank you for coming. <laughs> we are so glad you made it. Um, Dr. Fool, you're still muted. Oh. How about yes, now? yes, we can hear you now. Okay, okay. All right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I thought I should come in a few minutes early, so I make sure I know I, yeah, I can do everything. Okay. So there's a message. Okay. Mm, yeah, I, I just uh, sent a link just in case in the message, so it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's uh, wait maybe another minute or two and then I'll introduce you. And if it's okay, Victoria here, she's one of the co-moderators um, here. She yes. usually asks a general question in the beginning so the audience gets to know you, like uh, what your, like what sure. your um, journey was to become a scientist. Oh. Field. Yeah, I I have whole 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 book full. Oh, <laughs> whole perfect. Book full of story. Oh, yeah, I have so many life stories about my 
path. Oh, yeah. But I don't think we should cover all those here, though. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but maybe, you know, the ones you would like to share just a little bit, then that would be, I think it's interesting for, especially for students that join us or, you know, younger people to know about. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, sure. Okay. And perhaps a topic of another room too in the future. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as a female, um, come from a different country, came from a different country, it, it's uh, it's really challenging in many many ways. So yeah, still I, I think still yes. now yeah, <laughs> I completely agree. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay. I think we can slowly start. So um, welcome everyone to the Science Society Club. We are very honored to have here today our special guest speaker, Dr. Fu. We'll talk about her research in sleep, um, in sleep research. And let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Fu. She received her PhD in molecular biology and biochemistry from the Ohio State University. And her thesis actually was focused on cloning and characterizing genes mutations in the filamentous fungi, um, giving rise to sulfur and nitrogen metabolism phenotypes. Then she did her postdoctoral training at the Baylor College of Medicine where she started her career in human genetics uh, of disease. And during her time at Baylor, she cloned the genes responsible for the fragile X mental retardation and myotonic dystrophy. Um, it's, a, it's very important work. And her work led to the discovery that expansions of unstable repeats are the molecular mechanisms underlying the phenomenon of genetic anticipation. The phenomenon where um, disease onset is earlier and severity greater in subsequent generations. She then spent four years in the biotech industry and was one of the early scientists at the Millennium Pharmaceuticals Inc. and later at Darwin Molecular Corp. She returned to academia in uh, in the late 90s and uh, since then she has been working in the field of human circadian rhythm and demyelinating disorders. I'm sorry. Um, and uh, her lab has identified two genes that we, uh, that when mutated can lead to devastating demyelinating disease. And in um, collaboration with Dr. Louis Tachek, her lab has also identified several mutations for advanced sleep phase syndrome that affects people's sleep schedule behavior. And recently new genes and mutations were identified in her lab that affect human sleep quantity. Much of this work has moved from gene mutation identification to in vitro studies and in vivo modeling of the mutant phenotypes in flies, fish and mice. Yeah. We are very honored to have you. It's it's a really great honor. So thank you. And Victoria, the stage is yours to ask your questions. All right. Thank you. And Dr. Fu, Science Society welcomes you. We're so happy you're here. And that was a fascinating um, recap of your research for everyone to listen to so yeah we it's it's really wonderful to you know you have your research to share and we have the link that people can read and i feel that it's also maybe respectful to the researcher to show to hear a bit about you as a person and so i would love to know where it was in your life that you first were inspired to follow a life in science or what what first interested you when when you were a child and then what has led to led you along your path to the research that you're doing now and i understand that that you have lots of stories to tell so i will let <laughs> <laughs> you can <Yeah>. choose <laughs> thank okay. you Dr. Hu. okay 
thank you so much. Really, honor is my to be able to be here and chat with everybody here. Uh, I'm very happy that I have this chance. So um, I wish I had some fantastic story that I can tell you how I was inspired to be a scientist. But I actually, I, I, I'm not those... I'm not those people, I, I always in my life, I always go one step at a time. And I think because my father died when I was eight and immediately we went into this very difficult situation. So I was always in the mode that um, it's, it's kind of like trying to survive. And my mother really wanted me to go to medical school. And, and I grew up in Taiwan. So our education system is very different from here. So there are you, everybody takes the same test in two days. And with the score, it kind of decides your fate, where you will go. And even though I was a very good student, those two days, something happened to me that my brain really didn't work. They just didn't want to work. So I didn't do very well in that big test. And so I didn't get into medical school, but my mother didn't really have money for me to retake the test the next year. So I kind of just went to uh, college and to study biological science. And of course, years later, I look back, I, I was so happy. I think it was destined for me to be a scientist, not a medical doctor, because I, I do enjoy science so much more um, than, you know, than I think if I would have been a, as a doctor, because I think as a scientist, you can help people in a much bigger way than a medical doctor one at a time. So I, I think that was that was how it happened. And I, I went to college, uh, major in biology, and then I came to the United States to get a PhD in, again, biochemistry and molecular biology. And then, you know, like, um, uh, Katrina said, uh, Katarina said that I was doing fungi as a graduate student, and and I, I kind of was always <laughs> I felt like very puzzled because we would do everything first in fungi back in the eighties, and then people would do the same thing in the mammalian system, and they would publish paper in a much better better journal than fungi. So I thought, well. In that case, I would just move to a, a much higher organism. And I decided that I will move to the, the top of the food chain, you know, the top of the organism, I will move to human genetics. And that's really how I went there. But I think that the big moment for me in my career that really changed the way I feel about everything was when I was a postdoc. And I was working on fragile X, uh, cloning fragile X gene. <clears throat> and then when I was studying the fragile X uh, mutation mechanism, I found that this repeat expansion has a direct correlation with the disease onset and all this genetic anticipation. Then I decided to look at the um, myotonic dystrophy. Now, when I did those work in very short uh, few months, and I cloned all those genes, and after that, there were patients uh, in those diseases, they started to call me in the lab and they would thank me, you know, like profusely to, you know, just uh, how grateful they were that I gave them the hope that, you know, they felt like someday, hopefully somebody will find a cure for whatever disease they have. And that really was a, a major moment that changed my life that I decided that I'm going to every everything I'm going to do from that point on will be human related. I want to do science that really impact human life. And that I think was, if I have any inspiring story, that will be my, you know, the, the point that really changed my life that I felt to be a scientist is such a great honor and, uh, you know, privilege really. So. Thank you, Dr. Fu. I feel that it's, it's an honor and a privilege to hear your story and <laughs> and i'm i hear also that you mentioned hope that that your that um the patients had you know thanked you for giving them hope and i i'm hearing that as a thread because you'd mentioned that you didn't pass the test but you you continued to be positive 
and you and you knew there was something for you and so i i'm seeing this element of hope in, in you you know in your personality and and so thank you so much for sharing that here yeah you're and, welcome yeah. and so uh, we look forward to hearing your research and the floor is yours okay you and, and and one other thing um it is what we usually do is we'll have you will present and then after you are Com you've completed your presentation to your satisfaction, then we have both a room chat in which people can post questions that, that we can share with you. And we can also invite some guests up to ask you questions after you have presented your research. So thank okay. you so much and enjoy. Okay. okay. So um, when Katarina talked to me uh, when I was doing the preparation, I told her that I decided not to do a slide presentation because I do that all the time. I think for today, it will be better if I kind of just tell you about my journey in uh, study sleep and everything about sleep research and what we have learned. I think that's uh, much more interesting than look at my slides. So, so I want to start uh, by talking about why study sleep and why sleep is important because about 25 years ago when i started to look into sleep because before that time i was doing all diseases right mental retardation neurological diseases and when i started to move into sleep people would always ask me well why do you study sleep sleep doesn't kill you so what's the point of study sleep now back then it was not as obvious you know i to me, it was just very interesting because sleep is such a mysterious thing in our life. If we can manage to live to 90 years old, we'll be spending 30 years sleeping, and yet we know so little about sleep. So that was my um, curiosity that I felt like I wanted to uh, um, study sleep. And also for me personally, it was a next level of a challenge because with human genetics, study disease is much easier than study behavior, and sleep is a behavior trait. So I thought that well, it would be a good challenge. But after so many years of study sleep, now we know, and I have learned so much more about sleep, right? And actually, there is so much scientific evidence now reporting, and we, we know this as a fact that if, if people or if I or anybody who don't get enough sleep or who don't pay attention to sleep or who on a long-term basis uh, not getting good sleep, the chance for the person to get all kinds of diseases, right? All, almost all the diseases that people link to aging, actually, if you don't get good sleep, your chance of getting those diseases is much higher than if you get good sleep. So we know that sleep is very important for our health. Right. And people ask me this often, and I always say to me, sleep, the, there are only two things more important than sleep for, for, for our survival, really, in my book. One is air, and the other one is water, because in fact, we can survive longer without food than we are without sleep, which will tell you that how important sleep is for our survival. And then, and very simply, if I don't get good sleep, I wake up, I don't feel good. I'm crabby, my brain doesn't work very well, right? So sleep is very important. Now, how did I start to look into sleep? And really it's by accident or it just came about uh, accidentally. So I was working in biotech industry and um, I decided to come back to academic because I was kind of getting bored in the biotech. And so at that time, two of my very important long-time collaborator, one is Chris Jones and the other one is, uh, is Louis Potacek. They, the year before I came back to uh, academic, they uh, started this, uh, collect a, a family um, for a woman. And this woman had a lifelong trade off She always had to go to bed very early and always had to get up very early. And so, I mean, early means that she had to go to bed like 6, 7 p.m. And she would get up 1 or 2 a.m. and start cleaning her house. So that's very, very extreme. And actually, she had gone to many, many doctors before she went to see Chris. And none of the doctors would believe her. They all told her, 
well, it's in your head, you're depressed and all whatever, you know, they would tell her that she actually didn't have a problem. In, in 1996, she decided that she would try again and she went to Chris Jones. And Chris, at that point, Chris um, was a sleep clinician and he didn't really understand science, but he, by being in the University of Utah, he learned a little bit about human genetics. So he approached his friend, uh, Louis Patache, to see if Louis will help him uh, collect this family. So a year later, they collected this large family and they needed somebody to find the gene and mutations for the, for the family. And that's when I came in, joined them. And so a year or a, a few years later, we found the mutation for this woman's family. And, you know, we made this uh, report um, in the journal. And this woman was so excited you know, her name is Betsy. And she, Betsy was so excited that she went on to all talk shows, <laughs> all the talk shows that she could um, get herself invited to. She went on and, she, and so essentially she did us a, a huge favor by doing all the advertisement for us. So we had thousands of people approach us and told us that there were, are also morning larks and everything. So that's how we started to look at um, morning larks, or we call it advanced sleep phase um, behavior, and that's a scientific term, but you know, layman, lay people's term will be morning larks. And so over the years, we have found maybe a dozen mutations now, and they are all linked to somehow linked to circadian rhythm. So I think that our study in this morning lark or sleep schedule behavior actually helped people uh, who were doing circadian rhythm really link the circadian rhythm to human condition to help people connect that, oh, circadian rhythm actually is very important for us, not just for Drosophila or mice. It also regulates our sleep schedule. And I think um, that's very important. So we were looking at all these morning larks and we were screening mutations. And al along the line about 2005, we found this mutation in a small family, and this family, they, they came to us and they say that they are, they are morning larks, so we say, okay. And we found the mutation, usually what we would do is, after we find the mutation, we will go back to talk to these people just to confirm that the, the, the phenotype and behavior trait is real. You know, we, we want to triple check and everything to make sure it's correct, because Everything else after that is so much more expensive <laughs> than that point. So when we went back to talk to these people in the family, we found that actually these people, they are not truly morning larks like all the other people that we were studying. Because all the other people that so up to that point we were studying, they all got um, get up early, but they also go to bed early. But for this particular family, they actually get up early, but they don't go to bed early. They go to bed like, you know, most, you know, regular population, you know, somewhere about 11 or midnight, but they get up like five o'clock or something. So that's the, that's when we realize, well, these people, maybe they're not morning larks. Maybe they just need less sleep. So we then made mouse model and, and check the mouse models. So everything, every mutation we find, we always make mouse model to confirm that the, the phenotype is accurate. Uh, in fact, we have many mutations that we make mouse model and the mice don't have any phenotype. And then we, we really, if the mice don't have phenotype, we cannot do anything further. So, and so this particular mutation, when we made the mouse model, this mice also sleep fewer hours than regular mice. And that's the point that we realize, oh, okay, this mutation actually makes people and mice uh, require less sleep. But that really was only one mutation. So we reported in 2009, and again, it, it was written up in New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and all these big newspaper, and in some TV, you know, on TV programs. So again, thousands of people approached us and say that, well, I'm one of them, or I know somebody is like that. And of course, not all these thousands of people are all nature short sleepers. Only in a small fraction of them are nature short sleepers. So we, we, we distinguish people who are really 
born with uh, uh, this trait, we call them nature show sleepers, to distinguish from people who train themselves to sleep fewer hours uh, and than they really need. And those we call them habitual show sleepers. So for the nature show sleepers, these are the people who um, almost all of them say they are lifelong this way. And occasionally there will be some of them say they really noticed after a uh, teenage year. And that's because um, during teenage years, our body, because of all the hormones, it really mess up our sleep schedule. So people, it's harder for people to know uh, their sleep schedule or sleep um, duration or how many hours of sleep they need. So for the nature show sleepers, most of them say, well, even as young, as far, as long as they can remember, they never really need more than four to six hours of sleep. And so, um, so far we have found, uh, we have reported five mutations in four genes for nature show sleepers. And these nature show sleepers are very interesting because since 2009, we now have collected more than 100 families. And we looked at more, you know, again, more than 100 of these nature show sleepers. And so over the time when we were studying these people, gradually we realized that there are a series of temperaments or characters that's very common for these nature show sleepers. They are usually very optimistic, you know, and they are very active all day long, you know, even though they only sleep four to six hours, but they are very, very active. The rest, you know, when they wake up the next of a day, the next day they're very, very active. And they also, a lot of them have higher pain threshold means that they can tolerate more pain uh, than we can. So for instance, when they go to dentist, they don't need the novel can or they can exercise for hours, 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 and they don't really feel uh, muscle pain and stuff like that. And also some of them say that they have very good memory. For instance, one family, they have very good audio memory. So if they hear something once, they never forget. So when they go to school, they don't need to take any notes because they only need to show up and listen to the lecture and they will remember everything they have heard. Uh, which is the great advantage when you are going to school. And so another family, um, uh, another example is from a family, they, the, all the nature show sleepers, they speak multiple language. And in fact, in that family, the, the fewest language is seven languages. And the, the highest number was, I think it was 13 languages. So it's some, some really, you know, like amazing uh, memories of these people. And we also noticed that they, they seem to live a long, healthy life, you know. So on one hand, we know that if we don't pay attention to sleep, and if we subject ourselves to sleep deprivation or poor sleep quality, and after decades, you know, three, four decades, we will have higher chance to get Alzheimer, cancer, or whatever, high blood pressure, or all these diseases. But these nature show sleepers, actually they sleep shorter time for their whole life, but they live to 80s, 90s or longer, and they don't seem to have any problems. Now, another example, it just came to me is um, a professor from UC Santa Barbara, and she retired a few years ago and she emailed me. And she was late 70s when she emailed me and she was still doing triathlon. So, they're very, very active and very optimistic and very healthy. So then it occurred to us that maybe, maybe even though they sleep shorter uh, time, but their sleep is more efficient in the sense that we know that when we are sleeping, our body actually is working very hard for us, right? It's trying to remove all the toxins, all the waste products that we have accumulated when we are awake. And it's trying to repair all the damages that we got when we we're awake. And it's trying to generate more energy for us. So the next day we will have enough energy to go out. So our body actually is working very hard when we are sleeping. But for this nature show sleepers, they, their sleep must be more efficient so that they, the, the, all the sleep functions, right? 
all the body function that when we are sleeping, for me, an eight-hour sleeper, it takes eight hours to accomplish maybe 90 or 95 percent of whatever the task that uh, sleep is doing for us. But for these nature show sleepers, maybe it only take four to six hours and they can, the function can achieve to 98% or higher for these people. And therefore, they can stay active longer the next day and live a long, healthy life. So we started to wonder about this, you know, for, for maybe their, their sleep is more efficient than ours. And so then we started to think, well, how can we prove their sleep is more efficient? We're thinking, well, we have to figure out how they can sleep so efficiently so we, the rest of us, can also sleep as efficient as they can. But then after a while, we start to think, well, another very interesting feature they have is they are very resilient. They are resistant to stress. They are very resistant to all kinds of negative conditions in the, in the life, including the health condition, right? They are resilient to negative health problems. So we thought, well, maybe we can start to test this idea by use um, mouse models of different diseases. See if we, when we put the nature shows limitations onto mouse models of whatever diseases that we choose and to see if these mutations of the short sleep can change anything about their disease pathology. So we just decided to start with Alzheimer. And that's really just because Alzheimer is such a big problem for our society right now. And it's such a huge economic burden. So we thought, well, okay, we'll start with the Alzheimer. So we took two different um, Alzheimer mouse models. I'm sorry. Sorry, maybe I'll mute. I need to drink. Take your time, Dr. Fu, please. <laughs> Hi, it's Katie. Yeah, thank you so much. Really great discussion. And um, thank you to everyone. Katerina, of course, as always, for pulling this room together. Really, really fascinating topic. Um, and just for anyone that's joined in the audience, um, Dr. Fu will be speaking and then we'll give everyone an opportunity to come up and re uh, ask questions. You're more than welcome to read the study at the top of the room in the pinned link and please feel free to invite others to the room, share on Clubhouse so we can bring in others to this amazing conversation. Um, thank you so much again. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, my throat was itchy. <laughs> so um, so we decided to take two different kind of um, Alzheimer mouse model. And one is um, a beta, plaque and the other one is tau tango and so actually our lab is not really alzheimer lab so we and we we know that there are two uh two lines of research in alzheimer uh, research one is a beta and one is tau and we decided that we're just not going to be biased by one or the other we would just do both and so we first put the very first uh, short sleep mutation that we found, it's on FAC2 gene. We first uh, took that mutation in, in our mouse model and crossed onto both of these two Alzheimer mouse models. And of course we waited for three to six months and we found that actually the wild type mice with Alzheimer mutation, they form really a lot of flags at six months old for, for the mouse models. But if we put our short sleep mutation onto these Alzheimer mouse models, then they they have significantly, really dramatically fewer plaque than the control mice. And so at that point, well, so that's for plaque. And we found the same thing for Tau Tango, that after six months, the, the natural short sleep mutation on the Tau Tango mouse model, they have much less Tau Tango than the control mice. So at that point, we say, okay, great. Maybe our hypothesis is right, but this could be completely coincident, right? Completely has nothing to do with short sleep. It's because of DAC2 gene, right? Maybe something, maybe DAC2 play a role in Alzheimer that we didn't know. And so when we put these mutations on the Alzheimer uh, mouse models, it, it did something. 
So we decided to take the second mutation, second natural short sleep mutation, and put onto these two different uh, Alzheimer mouse models. And sure enough, after six months, again, the second natural short sleep uh, mutation, when we put it onto these Alzheimer mouse models, it can significantly reduce the A beta plaque or tau tango. And so that, those were like really the, uh, the most important thing for the paper that uh, Katharina put it on there. And the rest of the paper, we just did uh, some molecular study to, to see the A beta level in the tissue, the tau, phosphor tau level in the tissue and how it affects the molecular mechanism. But I think the biggest message I, we wanted to tell people is that because these natural show sleepers, we think that their sleep is more efficient. And so when the sleep efficiency is high, it means sleep quality is good, it can help delay Alzheimer pathology progression, right? We can never say that these people will never get Alzheimer. But I think it's fair to say that instead of getting Alzheimer at the 60s or 70s age, we may be able to delay it to your 90s or over 100 years old. And that's, I think that's pretty fair um, estimation. So, um, so that's what we have so far. And so in the lab now, we, um, we're working very hard in trying to understand the molecular mechanism and also the neural circuitry uh, um, pathways. So there are two lines of investigation. One is really use neuroscience uh, tools, all the neuroscience uh, tools to understand the circuitry and the sleep promoting, wake promoting uh, neurons and how they talk to each other. And the other line is use molecular mechanism and really understand molecular mechanism. And now for me, you know, people ask me all these questions all the time. So I always say that it, if you can think of any machine or just a car, right? You want to know how to fix the car. You have to first know how the car works, how all different parts fit together and how the machine runs together. So you can, so when the car breaks down, you know how to fix it. And so it's essentially the same thing that we're trying to understand how sleep is regulated in the normal people and also in the nature short sleep people. And so we can compare what is different between the nature short sleepers versus normal sleepers. So we can know why their sleep is more efficient. And I always tell people, my dream is that 10 or 20 years, I hope it's 10 years, <laughs> not 20 years. I hope 10 years from now, we can all go to hospital um, and it, it will be something like now, if we go to hospital, they put this uh, cuff on your arm and they can tell you your blood pressure and it can tell you, oh, okay, you, you, you are normal, you have high blood pressure or whatever. And my dream will be 10 years from now, we can go to hospital and they can use some very simple equipment and tell you, oh, your sleep you know, efficiency is, you know, 70, 80, 90, or 95, or whatever, you know, it's in a very simple way to help us determine our sleep efficiency. So that would be my dream. So I think maybe I'll stop and see if people have questions. Oh, people have so many questions. Um, <laughs> let's do a flash of mics to create an order. So I see Kirk, I um, see yeah, thank you so much for the great presentation. Um, it was really wonderful to hear the journey that led to this. Um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to give Jamie the first turn to ask his question. And since we have so many people right now on the stage, let's keep it at one to two uh, questions so everyone gets a turn and we don't stretch, like we don't... Uh, take too much of um, Dr. Fu's time. So, Jimmy, go ahead, and then um, we'll just go in PTR, I guess. Thank you. Thank you very much for that talk, Dr. Fu. That's absolutely Thanks. fascinating. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And, and actually, this, this is, I'm quite excited. So here's my question. I am actually blind, and my sleeping is honestly horrifying. Like, I cannot keep a rhythm. 
Um, no matter like that, I've been given melatonin to fix that out. I've even been given sleeping tablets to sometimes put me to sleep. Now, even when I sleep, technically sleep the whole night, my body will still crave to sleep in the middle of the next day. I, I and and sometimes when my sleep does go normal, it will completely go like crazy again. I cannot keep it straight. I cannot and never not for years and years. I have heard that when you're blind, you cannot see the circadian rhythms of the day or night. So your brain has much bigger problems for like regulation and stuff like that. Um, do you have any like um, feedback or information on this or insight into how a kind of issue like this could be dealt with if anybody else had anything even similarly? And obviously anything that could help me get a good night's sleep would be brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yes. So it's true that people blind it's harder for them to synchronize with our environment. But you can use, um, you know, like food, uh, a lot of things can help you in trend. Like if you eat always at a certain time and it will help your body, you know, keep a rigid, uh, more regular schedule for your body to know the rhythm. And so there are many things. Maybe your body rhythm is also not exactly um 24 hours that will also affect uh, your rhythm uh, unfortunately i'm not a sleep doctor and i it's i'm not supposed to tell people <laughs> anything about how to improve their sleep but i i do know that um blind is the most se uh, severe problem is your entrainment and you can help your body in train by uh, keep your like routine very regular and unfortunately, there is no uh, no good way to 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 improve this. So I'm sorry. I, maybe other people know more about this. No, not not at all. Your insights. So what you're essentially saying then, and this probably is valid for other people with sleeping issues, that even just by taking care of the body's routine, as if you had a normal sleeping pattern, it can help shape it so that your brain will rest at those times is that what you're saying yes 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 excellent yes. thank you yes. thank you very very yeah. much thank you yeah because i know that food if when you eat the timing of your eating also can any environmental cue can help you in train but the for people who can you know see they the, the strongest cue is the light which is the easiest way to entrain your body but if you don't have that you the food or your activity can help you in train. Great, thank you very much. Okay, Cece, go for it. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fu. That was so wonderful. It was an amazing talk mm -hmm. um, and I learned so much. Uh, so the question that I have, um, you talked about the natural short sleepers. Um, so for people who are not natural short sleepers, uh, and I, I, I believe I'm not because I like to sleep. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, and you talked also about sleep efficiency, right? Like sometimes it's not how long you sleep, but how efficient your sleep right. is. Right. Um, yes. Yeah. So is this something that can be acquired for people who don't have these gene mutations or do you maybe foresee it happening sometime? Like maybe there's a way to maybe acquire that efficiency of sleep to, you know, help us, I don't know, maybe somehow be as uh, strong against things like Alzheimer's <laughs> as, you know, yeah. people who have the natural short sleeper genes. So is there right. a way to acquire it? Right. Yeah, no, right now, um, I don't think there is a way to, to, well, actually, I think everybody should pay attention on their sleep. So this is very important. So everybody has different rhythm and everybody needs different amount of sleep. Because you cannot say everybody needs eight hours. It's like say everybody should be five for three, right? So everybody needs to figure out what's the best time for them to go to bed and what's the best time to get up and how many hours is best. I will use myself as an example. Right? I've, I've tried this for many years and figure out my schedule. So if I go to bed at 10 or 10.30 and try to get up at 6, I will wake up like three times <laughs> through the night and next day, 6 o'clock, I will feel totally 
exhausted and I you know need three cups of tea before I could just get going. But if I just stay up till midnight and sleep till the seven, I can sleep through the night and seven o'clock I'll feel perfect, you know? And so that's how our body is very sensitive because it's two components. It, one component is your sleep schedule, your body rhythm, and you need to figure out. And the other component is how many hours of sleep that you need. So if you sleep at the best time and the best number of hours, it will be the best efficiency for your sleep, right? So that is, is a little bit complicated that way. And right now, if, if I say, well, okay, I sleep from 12 to 7, maybe my sleep efficiency is 70%, uh, 90% or 95%. But I think the, the, the thing that distinguish us from nature show sleepers is that I feel that their sleep efficiency is probably approaching 100% like 98 percent or something so they could do that for 100 years and they still stay healthy but for the rest of us if i try to do the best schedule for myself the best number of hours maybe i can do 95 percent and i can avoid getting all these diseases but uh, one of our research goal is try to figure out how to get how to help everybody everybody not just people with sleep problems everybody to increase their sleep efficiency by learning how nature show sleepers sleep work, right? So now we're working very hard to figure out why is their sleep more efficient? If we can figure that out, we may be able to come up with something, maybe a vitamin pill, a pill like vitamin M to help everybody to sleep more efficiently. And therefore everybody can stay healthy longer and live a long healthy life. And that's one another very important goal for our research. That sounds wonderful. And yeah, I definitely look forward to that, um, having some sort of pill of vitamin to help us all sleep <laughs> more efficiently. Um, and that will definitely be a great uh, um, result of your research. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, um, yeah I'm going to pass yeah. it on to Kirko. Kirk, go ahead. Oh, I was clapping. Uh, Serena, did you want to go first before I ask my questions? No, please go ahead. Uh, so I got two questions. And I hope the first one, I hope I didn't miss, uh, miss this part. Um, so, uh, in the, the studies between the wild type and um, mutated forms of, of this gene, did you find that there was like a difference in like level of expression uh, between the two is the first question. And is the second question, if there was, did you then uh, play around with uh, changing the ex expression level, like, um, like maybe throwing in like a, a promoter region that you can like kind of like turn down the, the uh, expression or ramp it up to see like if that was a positive or negative effect versus the wild type? Yes, so, so far um, the mutations that we found, most of them are uh, neuropeptide or neurotransmitter receptors and they don't show change on the transcription level. But the closest, um, to your question will be the, the very first mutation we found in DAC2. DAC2's expression doesn't change, but DAC2 is a transcription factor that regulate orexin expression. And I don't know if you know, you all know orexin. Orexin is one of the very important neurotransmitter regulating uh, wakefulness. So people who have orexin uh, neuron damage, they have uh, narcolepsy. So DAC2 regulate orexin. And so the mutant DAC2 actually has reduced transcription repressor activity, therefore lead to increased orexin expression and therefore lead to, uh, the sh the, it contribute to short sleep phenotype. We don't know if that's the only thing, uh, it's completely going through orexin or not. So we, we don't have enough evidence to say that, but at least that tooth function is partly going through regulating orexin's expression. Okay, um, quickly before we continue, Dr. Fu, I wanted to know how much longer we had the honor of your presence. Oh, um, I think I can stay till seven, but we don't have to stay till seven. Oh, I've, we, I've ha we have questions for days. If, you got, if you're <laughs> only available till seven, then that's good to know. Um, so in that case, I'll go with mine. So currently, um, 
there are a lot of people suffering with COVID and sleep disturbance is a standard feature of this. So I was curious if you had any, um, maybe, I know that you said you don't recommend things. We discussed melatonin and vitamin D, but do you have any insight into how to help the patient suffering? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know. I don't really have any good insight on that. And yeah, I actually personally, I don't, even when I travel, I, I just suffer through jet lag. <laughs> I don't like to take any pills. So, and I, yeah, so I really, in that, you know, I'm not a clinician, so I can't say that. There's something else I want to say. Um, I think it's a very important point to help everybody understand how important this research is. Um, this is somebody who, somebody recently helped me uh, see this because we are having trouble raising, uh, to getting research money. And, but this is very important. So let's say if I need eight hours of sleep every day, and if we can figure out how to increase sleep efficiency, then maybe all I need is seven hours or six and a half hours and I will get great sleep which will save me one hour a day, right? Just for me, one person. And so then in a year, I will save 365 hours for myself. Now, if I say, well, one hour is worth $10 for me, then one year it will be worth $3,650 for myself alone. But if we can figure out a way to help everybody sleep more efficiently, and let's say we have seven, eight billion people on earth. If we just have one billion people benefit from this, there will be thirty-six, fifty billion dollars on our economic impact. And so that's that's another point I want to um, say that it, I thought that it's very important about point out how important this is. So, okay, I'll, <laughs> any more questions? Sure. No, we're going to, yes, millions of questions, but we have limited times. So um, I was going to pass the mic to Dr. Shaw. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Denise, and thank you for sharing your important, I mean, paper, Dr. Yin. My question is about, I mean, the two, which you just explained about it. As we know that it's uh, this gene belonging to the family of the BHL. AG41, and I was just wondering, did you find any evidences around the relationship between this gene in mutation and the thyroid, I mean dysfunction or thyroid cancer or not? No, no, we haven't, we haven't found, um, you know, I suspect that if we cross our mouse model, the short sleeve mouse model to you know, all kinds of diseases, we'll find that the short sleep mutation actually can help delay diseases or prevent diseases. We simply don't have enough uh, research funding to do all those things. But we have not um, made any, we, we have not found any direct connection between um, these mutations or even the circadian mutations uh, directly connect to thyroid cancer, no. Okay, passing the mic to Katie. Yeah, um, can John go next? He he was here early on and asked me if he could ask a question. Thank you. Okay, John. Yeah, Katie. yeah. Thanks, Katerina. A uh, couple of quick things. Um, so, uh, Jamie asked about alternative methods to light and in synchronizing sleep wake cycles. Raises a couple of really interesting questions as to why do uh, sighted people, when placed in uh, an environment uh, that is insulated from solar light cycle at 24 hours, which implies that there is a nature nurture training of that sleep wake cycle. Um, and the second thing is, uh, Jamie, I hope you have a text to speech. Uh, I sent you an article uh, from Frontiers in Neurosciences where they're experimenting with electrical stimulation, external non invasive electrical stimulation to reprogram the pineal gland to synchronize um, 
melatonin levels uh, to help reestablish uh, a normal uh, circadian rhythm. The other uh, observation I want to make is if you look through the lens of evolutionary biology, uh, sleep is not necessarily universal across all species in, in, in its solar synchronization. Um, and so the, the necessary functions that cause sleep deprivation to be so damaging are not necessarily uh, uh, proactively evolved in a teleologic sense, but more a response to the fact that we're either nocturnal or diurnal as prey or predators, um, and that, it, that the adaptations are secondary. And then the question I have for you, and thank you for a brilliant um, research and discussion, the question I have for you is as follows. Um, a lot of the therapeutic interventions for Alzheimer's have focused on uh, amyloid and tau and so forth. Um, and increasingly, it looks to be that those are more epiphenomenon than causative factors. And you're probably aware of Rudy Tanzi's work. He identified the fir first three genes associated with Alzheimer's disease uh, at Harvard. And he's looking at those um, uh, accumulations uh, as epiphenomenon related to inflammatory conditions in the brain. And so my, my question to you about the mice model and the genetics you've uh, discovered um, around short sleep, um, whether you can map a pathway from them into uh, the immune system and the uh, inflammatory state of the glial cells in the brain, which have been implicated in more modern models of, of the etiology of Alzheimer's disease. Thanks so much. Excellent question. <laughs> um, uh, exactly, that's what we are doing. <laughs> that's what, uh, we're collaborating with this um, uh, Johnny Kipnis, at uh, Washu, I don't know if you know him. He is um, expert in this um, in this area. So um, we, you know, in our lab, we don't have. Uh, we, again, we're not Alzheimer lab, or we're just purely sleep lab. So uh, we're collaborating with him to look at this, and I suspect, um, I suspect that um, immune function is definitely something. Because they, these uh, short sleepers, they don't get sick very much, and so their immune system is probably better. And you know, I suspect that we will find something there. But they're working very hard to look into this. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think your work is is very seminal in making that connection. And um, if you'd like an intro to Rudy, I'd be happy to make that introduction for you. I, I think he'd be uh, uh, really interested <laughs> really interested in having that conversation with you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Because we had a hard time to, to publish that paper, I can tell you. It took 14 months. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, um, Katie, back to you. Hi, it's Katie. Um, it's fine, I can skip my turn because of time, but I think Abyss had a question too. Okay, let's go for it. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, uh, Dennis. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fu, for your presentation. It was it's really an awesome work, and I'm I yet have to go into depth into like the, the paper. Um, I guess like my first question basically was asked by John. I was asking, I was actually thinking on, on the along the lines of like uh, if you investigated other genetic factors like uh, apogene, it's kind of indicated. I think uh, with Alzheimer's and I um, probably it's it's something worth investigating and I think like you keep like a very um, definitive answer to that but I do have two more questions for you so first one is like uh, how do you kind of define the um, sort of like an eff effective sleep and you mentioned that quite um, quite frequently in your discussion and I'm, I'm thinking along the side of like how to um, you know navigate between the different stages of non-REM cycle non-REM um, sleep stages and REM sleep stage so uh, what is like the most ideal kind of sleep state that you can actually have um, according to your or your definition that's the first question the second one is that um, you actually have investigated the tra trace of um, 
uh, beta amyloid and tau proteins in the CSF and other parts of the brain tissue. I'm just wondering, like, um, um, if you also have seen if there are if any kind of pathology in the lymphatic system or any kind of, or or even uh, the neurovascular coupling could actually cause some kind of um, um, sleep deprivation or lack of quality sleep that will lead to some kind of dementia or Alzheimer's-like disease. So yeah, these are my two questions. Thank you. Again, it's excellent questions uh, because we are not Alzheimer lab. So a lot of these things we just cannot do and we can collaborate with people. Um, so these are very good point. I, I you know, I would be able, to, I would have to find a collaborator to to look into those. The lymphatic system, I think the uh, Joni at WashU can, can look into that also. Now with your first question, that actually is the biggest question I have <laughs> for my lab, right? How do we know what is it that we have to look to know it's better sleep efficiency? What is this is different between these short sleepers than us in the EEG or whatever? And I, I have to tell you now that so far with EEG, we have not been able to see the difference. So my fear, my worry is that EEG is not sensitive enough for us to tell this. And I, 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 I don't want to say that I know that's the correct answer. No, I, I, I don't know if that's the correct answer, but I, I worry about EEG is not good enough. And so I'm looking for a collaborator that with a new tool to look at brain activity to see if we can find something even more sensitive than EEG to tell us what's the difference between short sleepers versus us in terms of efficiency. But, but, but now that's only look at the brain um, wave activity, but we can also use molecular route to, to look for the efficiency. And we're also looking very hard on that to say, okay, this is the marker that we can say is we can use for sleep efficiency. So those are like really most urgent question that we have. So those are very good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, passing the mic to Wassam. Going once, going twice. Okay. Oh, is the mic open still? Pass, passing, passing the mic to Eric. Okay, yeah. No, no questions at this time. Thank you. Okay. A wonderful That's talk. Um, amazing work, very promising, very Star Trek. So thank you. <laughs> I, I have one more thank if you, I'm allowed to squeeze it in. Is that possible? Sure. Um, just going to ask, I did see an article talking about um, teenagers and how um, they were thinking that uh, teenagers should actually perhaps go to school, start school a little bit later than they currently do. Because yes. going through puberty affects yes. their sleep cycle, so that if they, so they actually benefit from yes. sleeping more in the morning. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I, I I think that's so. There's uh one county I think it's either Illinois or Indiana. I I I cannot remember which state or maybe Minnesota. There was one county did an experiment that they had all high school in that county started school nine or nine thirty. And all every measurement significantly improve for all those high school students. It's very, very dramatic. So I, I do agree that all the high schools should delay their uh, school start time to nine or nine thirty. That would be much better for for the teenage people. Yeah. That is very promising. I, I hope they take that on board. Thank you very much, yeah. Doctor. Yeah. For your time. Yeah. yeah. I can tell you yeah. that uh, in university, when I got to pick my classes later in the day, like I hated taking quantum theory uh, at eight thirty in the morning. Yeah. If I had, if I could have taken it at eleven thirty, perhaps I would have had a nicer relationship with Poisson brackets. But as it is, I'm very bitter about the whole thing. So I take it very personally. Exactly. Very, very silly of me, but yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I really had a good time talking to you, everybody here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, I really appreciate the time you spent with us 
here and uh, maybe you can come back one day we have so many people back channeling me they um, would like to ask a question but um, I think we can we have now uh, 7 okay. p.m. and yeah. uh, so maybe yeah maybe you come okay. back one day <laughs> Sure, uh, sure. I'll be happy to. Yes. It was such a great honor to have you here. And everyone, uh, you know, sleeps and everyone is interested in your work, yes. I think. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. We really appreciate right. it. Okay. Thank Bye. You so much, Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, that you came and join us today for um, our sleep room. And um, yeah, I hope uh, you liked this discussion. And if you liked it, please follow the club or become a member of the club. And we have more guest speaker, almost every day guest speaker events like this. Tomorrow we actually won't have a room. It got um, rescheduled to April. 26 so we have two rooms on that day <laughs> because of that so, uh, but um, we, will, we will manage and um, we will have another very interesting room about aging um, Dr. Bonard will be here and uh, it was a very recent paper uh, that he published with his C. Elegance work about um, supplements that um, help basically see elegance um, have longer lifespans and it's a compound that would also be available to us quite cheaply so uh, would be really interesting and I'm really looking forward to his talk on Wednesday at 9 p.m. EST and then Dr. Van Zundert she will giving be giving a talk uh, she's from Sweden at 9:30 a.m about the really uh, breakthrough, I think, from my opinion, in ALS. Um, she found a specific neurotoxin that's produced in excess um, um, in um, ALS and uh, that contributes to the dying of neurons. And uh, then we'll have on Friday, I'm also really excited about that room at 1 p.m. EST, um, um, ex utero mouse embryogenesis, so uh, an artificial womb um, work, uh, quite a breakthrough. Will join us from the Weizmann Institute in Israel, and uh, I'm really looking forward to that. And um, yeah, and on the weekend, we'll have our roundtable discussion and our weekly recap. If you miss rooms, we do a summary room on Sundays at 1 p.m. EST to go over in a short way over the guest speaker events we have. So thank you everyone, it was a great pleasure and um, hear you all soon. I don't know if any of the moderators has something to add, please go ahead, I keep forgetting things. So <laughs> should sleep more. <laughs> no, that's it, thank you so much. Uh, this was a wonderful room. Thank you to everyone who came here. Uh, we apologize we couldn't get to everybody most of the time our guests only have an hour with us so it can be really difficult to get to everybody but um thank you for still being here um and joining our room so thank you um everybody <laughs> that's it yeah and i i have one last thing and that is thank you katarina thank you everybody especially thank you to dr fu and everybody sleep well <laughs> yeah exactly sleep well everyone bye <laughs> okay thanks everyone bye, -bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.